So on 1010, I've got a question for the panel members. How likely is Tesla, Elon, going to lay out a new roadmap, a roadmap of where Tesla is going to go? You know, I, you know, very likely, I mean, I think we all agree that they're going to lay out a roadmap for the kind of cars, right? They're going to say, here's Unveil, here's the Robotaxi, here's the program, here's when it's going to launch, here's how it might go. We, that, that seems to be the main theme of what's going to happen. They might also say, here's the kind of cars we're going to build and maybe the general time frame. But what about a broader thinking? We are now a robotics AI company. Here is the new milestones that we're going to try to shoot for broader than just cars, broader than just, you know, I guess it's this robotics AI umbrella. What, yo, okay, <laughs> everybody's hands go up, please. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I love it. Robert, you go first. He's going to lay out that transportation as a service is bringing a new experience nice. to the people of the world. And the electric vents are the way to start that conversation. People really don't understand what Elon's been doing for a decade to rip up uh, old thinking. For instance, I went to Mercedes-Benz and gave a talk to the R&D uh, group about a decade ago. And I said, why aren't you putting electric vents in your car? And they said, well, we've done our customer research and, and we found that most people want to touch knobs on the dash, which you hear over and over again. You know, oh, your Tesla dash is very plain. It's not nice like the Mercedes. They're talking about the, the vents and the buttons and the and the comfort that they feel of having a vehicle that behaves the same way that their last vehicle behaves. I went around America doing this kind of customer research and talking to people about, are you ready to get in a truck with a big screen that you're going to have to touch the screen to control the, the truck? Oh, no, one guy told me, I'm a farmer. I, I hate computers. I don't like touching computers. I, I have a flip phone, he told me, right? And I heard this over and over and over again that people like their knobs. Well, the 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 you you know as a tesla owner if you have two teslas uh when i get in my wife's tesla the vents reconfigure themselves so that they blow in my face the way i do my wife hates that she wants the air to go to the sides or not at all because she doesn't like uh, air in her face we used to argue about this over and over again on our uh, toyotas because i'd have to change the vents every time i got in her car to aim at my face and then she would get in the car and go god damn it scoville's been in here um and change my vents and she'd have to change them back um now that's automatic that's a better experience and it's an experience that the other vehicles cannot match because they have not put electric vents in their cars including waymo corporation or cruise or zooks they don't have this kind of technology um so how are you going to have the uh, the vents be in the right pl place for you when you get into the car. That's just the start of it. You add in, uh, you know, the Optimus, they're going to show off how that's going to make the experience of using the transportation network uh, better. Uh, loading your car in, going to shopping, picking things up, you right. Know, uh, and yeah, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but you can see in the next decade that's coming and, you know, so by the uh, a decade from now, we're going to be in a new world with a new kind of transportation experience. And I think Elon's going to lay out what the Tesla experience is. Okay, so that's still transportation as a service. Um, I was just thinking if there might be a broader milestone list that goes beyond that. Um, yeah. Well, I'm Go certainly going to be, you know, talking to as many employees as I can about, you know, what how are they going to further that experience are they are they going to uh, launch even more products that we don't know about and they've hinted that they will so uh, there's a lot that tesla can do with its data set it has the only fleet that's going across the golden gate bridge two times every two seconds mm -hmm. that tesla goes across the bridge now um so how can they turn that data advantage? Because it's a huge data advantage. For instance, let's say a, a truck stops on the Golden Gate Bridge and is burning. Well, a Tesla's going by it within two seconds and can build a Gaussian splat of that as it goes by and can share that with everybody else on the network and let us see it and let us understand it in almost real time. Nobody else can do that. Nobody else is driving a computer across the Golden Gate Bridge two times a second. Okay, uh, Simon. Yeah, Robert, I love your perspective, Robert. 
that's why I come here, guys. I, you know, I learned so much from listening to you guys and, and hearing the way you process information and your thought process. Um, I will say from a portfolio manager's perspective, um, you know, your question, Herbert, was sort of, it was a good question because you're, everybody wants to speculate as to how it's going to be presented. Um, and that's what everybody here wants to know. What I want to know and what I think would, would really uh, cause I would say all the Wall Street analysts to wake up, they need the numbers to fit into their spreadsheets and they just they just haven't gotten it. Now, am I hopeful or wishful that they're going to get it? I doubt it. But, oh my gosh, if Elon was to come out on stage and say, here's the product, here's the delivery date, um, and by the way, we're going to charge X amount of dollars, you know, or X amount of, you know, two or three dollars per kilometer, um, if they came out, and I don't think they would because they're not there on the street. And why do you do that? You basically come out on stage and say, oh, by the way, we're going to crush Uber and Lyft and all the other ride hailing apps. But we we haven't done so yet. Uh, but we're about to. But if we get some kind of economics behind it, that tends to be what moves the stock price favorably or negatively. When Wall Street is not spoon fed the numbers that they require to put into their spreadsheet, um, then they, they they react negatively. But you know, but also, if they if Tesla does explain, here's where we're going, and they lay out the roadmap, just like Jensen Wong will do on on you know his Nvidia calls. He's actually a master of laying out here's the roadmap and here's how many we expect to sell and here's the margins we expect and and so everybody can plug those numbers in and and the market wakes up to the value or the future cash flows of, of the company that to me would be pretty impressive if we got any kind of glimpse to the economic value of this and like i said i'm not hopeful i think he's just going to come out and say here's what we're going to do it's going to be spectacular similar to you know most of their other uh, events if you think like battery day and ai day and cyber truck day there was no economics in involved um they were just talking about here's where we're going with the company and then they deliver it over time you know now we're seeing the cyber truck and now there's talk on you know there's whisper talks that cyber truck could possibly could be the number one selling vehicle in america uh, within a couple of years, uh, before people thought it would be like a, a niche vehicle and they'd never sell more than 50000 a year. So, If I was sitting down with a money manager, I'd say, let's assume that robo-taxi is a bust and never makes a dollar, never does well. It's still going to increase the visibility of FSD. So can we talk about increased take-up rate and put that in the spreadsheet and see how that affects your your long-term view of, of the company? You're going to see an effect on the FSD because this is going to raise awareness of t Tesla's lead in AI uh, globally. I mean, I, how many people are going to hear about uh, RoboTaxi and FSD on 1010? A lot of people, particularly in the Tesla community, which most of the Tesla owners still are not really up to date on how good FSD is, unless they come on X every day and listen to Omar or watch his videos. And most people don't. And so this is going to greatly increase the take up rate. So let's put in some new numbers in your spreadsheet and see if that changes your viewpoint of Tesla's profitability uh, over the next three or four years, right? Now, let's assume uh, RoboTaxi actually is pretty good and has a, a global impact and has all that. Then we can walk through those numbers because they're pretty good. A Tesla, you know, even a cyber. Uh, you buy a new cyber truck for a hundred grand uh put ten thousand dollars down it's what seventeen hundred bucks a month payment plus you know a broken windshield here or there or a, a blown tire or 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 a little bit of maintenance new windshield wipers over time stuff like that it it cut let's call it twenty five hundred bucks a month for a full time on the road like an uber kind of uh, vehicle. Robert, Robert. Well, me, that me, that only costs three three bucks an hour, right? And you add a human to that, that goes up to twenty bucks an hour, and so you start saying, "Well, okay, let's say they start at the same price or a little bit higher." I mean, Waymo is charging what twenty percent more than an Uber right now in San Francisco. 
So let's say we match the Uber price. Uh, that means there's a whole lot of profit on each hour being driven by our vehicles going around, right? Robert, let me let me interject one one point also, and you're touching on that, but I just wanted to sort of uh, I wouldn't say cl clarify, but I actually want to highlight the point is I've talked to my brother about this, who's also a portfolio manager, and I said, imagine so this whole FSC you're talking about take rate. Obviously, the, pro the, the the profit margins are, you know, 100% uh, roughly. Um, but all of a sudden, when you have the only car in the world that drives itself, can you imagine what happens to the demand for the Tesla vehicles, right? And and so I think they could. There's a possibility that they get back to the fact of they're going to sell every single car they can possibly make when they nail this because people are going to say, well, I want a car that drives itself and that's going to drive in itself. It's going to drive the car sales and it's going to drive the FSD take rate, whatever that price is. And, and it actually hedges in terms of right now, all the car, all, all the legacy automakers are scaling back because high interest rates, they've already filled, you know, stuffed their channels. Um, and we're seeing layoffs and factory closures. And Tesla's already gone through that last year because they don't have, you know, they don't have uh, channels of stuff and they've scaled back and stock got hit last year as a result. But now that also becomes a hedge because they can offer the FSD for 99 bucks a month, which I, in my opinion is pretty much free, um, and drive their car sales. And when the car sales and FSD are, are, are high and they can't reach demand, so it creates this buffer in um, tough economic times to be able to drive not only the FSD trade grade, but also the car sales. Call it the flyway. That's, absol that's absolutely true. And we haven't even started talking about China. The reason all these companies are laying off is because they're sucking in China. Their cars are not, not being uh, bought in China because there's Neos, there's you know, Xiaomi's, there's Teslas, there's a whole bunch of competition for not just electric vehicles, but soon autonomy. And their, their market is very, very tech forward. They don't care about the privacy problems that you know the attitudes that we have here. Um, their their market is very very tech forward. They've been using pay for apps, everything apps for years. We don't have an everything app here in America or in the Western world yet. And so, you're seeing China is going is looking for innovation. And that's what the game is. And the other car companies can't provide it. The other American car companies can't provide it. They just don't have it. And I was done. I got muted, but that's a call. Sorry, Robert. I don't know what what happened, but uh, that was that was really, I, I think the whole the whole China topic is, is interesting. A lot of China deliveries just came out. And you're right. In terms of all American companies, even all Western companies that produce uh, autos, Tesla's honestly Even VW the, just laid off thirty thousand people, right? Yeah, I mean Tesla's in the best shape. I mean, basically, Western companies they went the partnership route, and now those are dissolving. The Chinese people they want uh, Chinese brands, or they want a Tesla, basically similar to like in the mobile phones, they want Chinese brand or they want an, an iPhone. They do um, like American brands. Buick yeah. made billions and billions over there. No, but it's changed. You know, it's, it has yeah. changed because they don't have the innovation to attract the right. customer on the street there. Right. So we're seeing that in the delivery numbers. We're seeing that in the both the China delivery numbers for China OEMs, and we're seeing it in the U.S. OEMs in their deliveries. You know, their China businesses have basically cratered uh, year on year, and it's 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 become a big problem and a source of angst for them. Um, so you're in Silicon Valley, you can see it on the freeway. Yeah, I'm regularly surrounded by eight Teslas and maybe a Rivian here or there, but you know, yeah. the, the, the nerds who live in Silicon Valley, cause it's literally everybody here is in the tech business. They know what's up. They're not going backwards. They're not going to buy a Toyota or a VW or a Ford because they just are not as good a vehicle because of the innovation. And this innovation has been going on for a decade, more than a decade now. Elon, you know, I, 
I spoke to Mercedes R and D uh, people uh, almost a decade ago, and we had these arguments. And you know, they couldn't put touch screen uh, screens in the cars. They couldn't put a computer that's always uploading, always downloading, always upgrading. They couldn't put uh, the cameras in the car because their customers didn't know why they needed cameras and an AI, and they just couldn't figure out how to sell a, a six thousand dollars setup uh, to a Mercedes Benz user, right? Right. The software defined vehicle and, and, and yeah. Bingo. And Elon's been able to innovate and innovate and innovate over a decade. And that innovation is coming, uh, is is really important. And we're going to hear all about that, you know, on 1010. Yeah. And then the moat that is created, because a lot of people, a lot of people probably in the audience wonder like, well, hey, why can't Ford or why can't GM just like look at what Tesla is doing and copy it? And the answer is, is it is it's multimodal it is it spans culture it spans organizational structure it spans process it spans innovation it spans supply chain design it span i mean i just literally rattle like you rattle off a half a dozen areas and you'd have to be able to transform in all of those areas to get this to get this right like for example how, like do you make 80% of the stuff or do you buy 80% of the stuff? And if you're in this distributed model, what's happened over time is they got comfortable with the margin structure. They got comfortable, you know, being able to say, and by the way, the average transaction price on a vehicle in the U S has gone up from $38,000 in 2019 to $48,000 in 2024. And so they've been able to ride up that curve you know, blame COVID, keep the pricing high, um, and and they've been able to survive on that. And meanwhile, in order to do EV, you had to you you had a supply chain and you had a supply structure that was much smaller in volume. So therefore, you had to figure out how to get your bill of material and get your construction techniques down at the most simplest level possible to figure out how to compete. And then once the volume starts moving more and more over to EV. What you're going to see is you're going to see this cratering effect of fi the fixed cost structure on ice becoming a bigger and bigger burden. And that's why you've started to see companies like Ford starting to separate this out. And you've, you've seen the flip happen in China. And now, you know, from a cost structure perspective, you know, they're in better they're in better shape building a new a new energy vehicle than building uh, an ice vehicle. And that same thing is going to happen globally. It's just going to happen at different times. And, uh, and and actually, we can keep China out of the U.S., but that but, but what they've created from a supply chain perspective and from an export perspective is going to help EV uh, adoption abroad. Um, but but if you so, don't have access to the China market, if you're not doing well in the China market, it doesn't matter what you do elsewhere in the world. You're not going to have a very successful growing car company. The China market really is in charge of where we, we go from here. Yeah, with, with EV, no doubt. Um, right. so, yeah. Not just EV, autonomy, because soon yeah. it's going to be seen as shitty EV if you don't have autonomy. Right. right. I, yeah. You know, you buy, if you live in, uh, my friend lives in Sacramento and has to drive to San Francisco every day, which is like an hour and a half drive. He bought a Model 3 with FSD so that he could do that drive easier. That's that's the Western consumer. In in Shanghai, it's a whole nother level of chaos and and people in the streets and stuff like that. It's a different world over there. But they they love innovation. They they love American brands. Don't get me wrong. They they do love American brands, but they love innovation more. And so they're gonna when they're choosing to put down their fifty grand or hundred grand on a vehicle. They're going to choose the vehicle that has the most innovation. Neo has a, 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 some innovation innovation that we don't have that they can swap batteries, for instance. And you know how are they going to answer the autonomy? We're going to see because they're testing it, they're building it as well. The Chinese car company companies look at the world very differently than the American auto industry does, and so I I, I just don't see good things if you don't do well in China. Yeah, so let's let's um, let's transition. That was a good conversation. And, and uh, Tesla has a factory there, right? So they're in. 
but yeah. they have to keep up the pace of innovation too, right? Um, yeah, and they're, local, they're locally sourced too, which um, what, which helps them. What people don't realize is when you set up a factory in China, but you import a bunch of shit, you're less valuable to them. So you you want to figure out how to. It's actually a better supply chain too if you can you can you know more locally source around your factory. So they're about ninety seven percent locally sourced. That moves up and down, but um, that's a you know it's a big deal for them in China. But I wanted to like switch gears. So we talked a little bit about Q three. We obviously have the Robo Taxi event coming up. We've got earnings after that. So there's like you know we have three things coming up in the next couple of weeks that will you know really drive sentiment around. The name, but then you've got Q4, and what's interesting to me is it looks like it looks like the macro auto business is in some weird state right now, um, where the, you know we have mixed consumer strength around the world, and you've you've got clear weakness happening in in auto. You've you've built a bunch of high dollar products. A lot of them are sitting in inventory. Um, and they've, they, they've, there's been some relative improvement in inventory. I've been looking at it. And by the way, that is, you know, if, you, if you've listened to this show, if you've listened to some of the podcasts Herbert and I have done over the last couple of months, like I've been screaming about inventory for a while, and it was the leading indicator to an auto slowdown that we're, that we're seeing right now. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about Q4. I'll be interested to see as the other auto companies go through, let's say they're just announcing deliveries uh, and as they go through and go, go through their earnings, it'll be interesting to see how they see the rest of the year um, closing out. I'd be interested in what people think about Tesla regarding Q4. But more importantly, I think Tesla's in a different position than these other companies, whereas Tesla has laid down the gauntlet for next year saying, look, we've got new vehicles coming out. We're, we're going to be also you know, making some gigantic advancements with you know, autonomy. And but before we even build the robo taxi, you know we're we're telling you we're gonna we're putting in capacity for about three million units, and we want to build about two seven. Like we're at least we're gonna enable, you know, with these newer vehicles, the ability to build two seven. They said that on page ten of their last earnings um, uh, uh, release. So, so, so I love just people's take on Q four, but more of yeah. I think it looks like Tesla's in a different position. I don't know what a GM or Ford or VW is going to say more about 2025 versus what Tesla. It looks like what it's going to be one of Tesla's biggest years from a product release perspective. Again, you know, this year was you know the ramp of the new Model Three and of course the Cybertruck and then version 12 with autonomy. And it looks like next year could even be bigger for Tesla's. Just would love to get people's take on Q4 and in the next year. I'll throw it over to the panel. I think the 1010 is going to put another shine on t Tesla that the average everyday consumer is going to be faced with. Okay, I'm buying a new car. Uh, d does it have FSD in it? And can it drive itself like the Tesla can? That that awareness is going to start having an effect. Is it going to be in four, Q4? I think you're going to see a little effect. Certainly going into next year, you're going to start seeing a much bigger effect of the take-up rate. And that take-up rate really is mat matters because you're right. A nearly 100% of that now is, is profit or is expenseless uh, revenue, right? Um, that lets that gives Tesla huge advantages in pricing and and promotions and doing things like low interest rates so people people can afford their cars stuff like that. It really does change the game, and I think that's going to be a big coming out of, of at, at ten ten. Jeff, if you look at so I was looking at at China sales. I was really sort of trying to understand all these. Uh, all these layoffs in China from, from legacy automakers. And, you know, the, the big differentiator that a lot of people aren't talking about is all these EVs that are being sold in China are, are cheap. They're, you know, fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 cars. And I don't, the legacy or, you know, it, it, they're just cheaper. Yes, they're tech forward, um, but it's a cost thing. So they're grabbing so much market share there, or Tesla is, um, with a car that's that's twice as expensive, and then you go to North America and you say, why isn't the why is the adoption rate in North America so much less than in China? I think in the United States now is just past ten percent 
of all new cars sold. And I think it really comes down to pricing and like the cheapest, you know, okay, there's like a, a Chevy Volt or some something like that, that you put all the, 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 the specials on it, but they're, 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 they're coming down in price with all of the rebates that the government's offering. Most people aren't aware of it. I talking to clients all the time and they said, yeah, but they're really expensive. And people, the average person today, just like I said, people in the country have no idea what a, what a Tesla is. Um, no offense to people in the country. I grew up in a fishing community in Bumblefuck, Prince Edward Island. So I am like as country as they come. Uh, but, you know, you, you go into middle America and, and they're not aware of this. But what I'm, what I'm going with is, is that United States, the reason why I believe that they're not over, you know, 10% yet, uh, or they are 10% and not 50 like China is simply affordability. And there's not any kind of compelling vehicle in North America that's being sold for $20,000 or $25,000. And then you add higher interest rates to that factor. So back to the initial point that, that Jeff, you're making was, you know, what does Q4 look like? Well, if you can start projecting, you know, 50% growth next year, uh, a more affordable Model 3 and Model Y and a Model 2 or whatever they want to call it, um, and nobody else can compete with that, like Jeff, you always talking and you're illustrating like the cost of their product, their production costs just keep going down and keep going down as they scale, which becomes, you know, so as you just keep driving down costs, it becomes more affordable. And as most people know, is the more affordable car, the, the larger the addressable market. So it will be interesting. Nobody's talking about that, but Q4 could be a big deal as they start projecting, here's how many cars we're going to deliver next year. And we're not, we're just talking about car deliveries. And we may be back to a case like we saw as interest rates come down and they're coming down fast. It may be similar to, you know, what we saw in 2000, uh, 2021. I mean, it's not a pandemic, but uh, where people, you just can't get enough of these vehicles because are there any compelling vehicles that you can purchase today in the United States for under, you know, $30,000? Gas or electric? That's yeah, hard. no, I think, no, I think I think those are, I think I think those are I think those are great points. But there there is some sort of gap or disconnect because everybody you know above thirty thousand dollars isn't buying a Tesla. They are buying other vehicles. And you're not going to have a hundred percent market share. You have to if we have everybody has to be realistic about that. But there is an awareness thing out there. We talked about it. Previously, I'm a I'm a I'm a proponent of, of testing for awareness and then figuring out what you do. Um, and but at the same time, I've also matured on that a bit. And it feels like Tesla knew something related to autonomy and its maturity. And it's like, well, how 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 aware did you want people on twelve on version twelve point one? I mean, it's end to end. It's neural net. It's kind of nerdy. It wasn't like that great. It was good but it's better than anything else out there. But, you know, and now it's almost like, okay, it's getting to the point now where, you know, the interv interventions are becoming far more rare. And now you've got this, you know, three and a half, 10 vehicle, uh, you know, iconic looking vehicle driving around by itself. And now you're getting to the point where, you know, you, you may want to drive a lot more awareness around it. And I'm wondering, I often do wonder, What's driving Tesla to kick up the production so so much higher next year? I mean, we have the rate backdrop. It's it's happening, but it's, you know, what is it going to be, 200 basis points? I mean, you're still going to be, we're not at zero interest rates again, right? So, um, so you have to ask yourself, like, is it is it these new affordable vehicles? Like, what's driving Tesla to kick production up 50% versus 2023 or 2024? And, you know, is it supervised going to unsupervised? Is Tesla announcing the Tesla network? Is Tesla rolling out the Tesla network? And there's going to be this huge demand for vehicles because, you know, as the driver, you're going to keep a lot of the money. It's going to be a great deal for you. And uh, if you if you if that's something you want to do, if you don't want to do it, you don't do it. Um, and like what, you know, so I, it'd be interesting for, you know, what, why do why why is Tesla talking about building two point seven million vehicles next year when they only built 
you know, maybe they'll build one eight and change or low eight one eights um, this year. That'd be an interesting thing to kick around. Uh, but I do think if you're, like, if you're an analyst, I love the way Simon, like you, you tee this up. If you're an analyst, the backdrop is declining rate environment. Hopefully we're getting through whatever this slowdown is. And, and, and from an auto perspective, Tesla is going to get through that faster. They don't have the 100 days of inventory. They have 18. And they have a much you know, more localized supply chain. So therefore, they don't, they're not disappointing a bunch of partners in the process where they've got to deal with inventory. And they're extremely localized around their factory. So that network, that time between I, I made a decision, I told somebody, some supplier to build something, to I'm making it into my factory is that much shorter. So they can adjust to these things a lot faster. So what is that backdrop? What's driving this bullishness in Tesla? I don't know if anybody else has any other takes on, on that for next year. Jeff, I have a question. Do you think it is in with your supply chain expertise, do you think that it's possible that it that is it realistic for us to assume they could achieve 2.7 million production rate next year? Oh yeah, I mean they have. I mean they 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 had. I mean some people thought like you know they announced like two three five or two four already, uh, but they haven't been they haven't been running at that. So you have a bit of a a utilization thing happening, which is kind of foreign for Tesla. Shanghai's running like balls to the wall. Fremont's running balls to the wall, but in Austin and Berlin, not so much. So they took some capex out. They took people out. That's what you saw happen in April. So that helped them from a cost perspective. But we haven't really seen Tesla like fully uncorked with those two factories. Those two factories are more highly automated and should actually, when they're at scale, you know, be lower cost than the first two factories. We haven't seen it. But are they capable of the two seven? Absolutely. I think they are installing the three million uh, of capacity. And when Tesla does that, they have a history of building somewhere between 10 and 15% of their installed capacity. So they, they, they get it pretty close. And uh, because they tell their suppliers to, to put that, that rate of capacity. And so when you, when you see like the, in the earnings deck and you see the, the factories and what they add up to, just realize that there's a supply base behind that, that Tesla has to capacitize. And any unique tooling that's unique to a Tesla you know, Tesla is part of that investment process with that supplier. So they have skin in the game with it. So they, they've got to get this signal right. So I think they're doing that. And then the additional capacity in 25 is going to be with the RoboTaxi. The numbers that you see on that page don't include uh, the capacity for unboxed. That is a different, um, that's a different, uh, that's a different set of numbers that haven't been added in yet. New Model Y is coming next year. Cybertruck is going to continue ramping up, and you're going to see new Cybertruck models announced next year, right? All of that figures into it. The Model 3 is rocking. If you haven't paid attention to Omar, I don't know what you're doing on this show, but uh, the Model 3 is getting rave reviews around the world and seeing uh, it's the number one car, I think, in Spain right now. Right. So they can sort of for, foresee, OK, Model 3 demand is going to continue going up. Cybertruck demand is going to continue going up. When this refreshed Y comes out, there'll be new excitement around why that'll go go up. You know, and we haven't even started thinking uh, of the second order, um, you know, uh, effects of RoboTaxi and what that's going to do for the brand and for get people into stores because they're going to realize this self-driving car is here and it really improves your life if you have one yeah the price elasticity right they know that i'm pretty certain they, they are aware of exactly what would happen if you reduce the price by even to five thousand dollars more and you know that's a bit more of an uh, exponential jump in volume so now they're going to sell a more affordable two more affordable cars even before we wait for the you know a, a, the, the mythical twenty five thousand dollar car that might happen second year we, and then you add in top of that lower interest rates and then what if they continue the, if they wanted to push and sell metal they can't they'll just do zero down zero percent interest rate lower the price then you got the promise of fsd and i think what you were saying simon makes sense which is it's all about the price at this point they need to get down to that one to that level, and then it's just going to sell like crazy. 
And I think we're, we're very, very close to that. So hitting the 2.7, I, I just don't imagine that that's going to be a huge stretch for them. And then you're asking about Q4. Actually, I'm a little bit more, I, I, I'm not ready to say that Q4 is going to be any more different than what Q3 was. They'll just do more of the same. And what you guys were saying is what will happen in 1010? If that comes out and it gets press, but it's it's going to be a demand driver, I agree, but it's going to be just a small bump as opposed to an actual more affordable vehicle like, right, like Simon was saying, which will not come until 2025. So that's the, the big question is, you know, this is a presentation, a, a demo. Does it actually move sales? It can if they say this is now available and it's really, really cheap, which I don't think any of us are expecting will happen in 1010. That's a lower probability. So otherwise than that, I think it'll be a demand driver because it's FSD, but it's it's still the people who can afford it versus the people who can't, right? Hey, Herbert, I, I joined up here early on um, because you had asked an opening question of what next, and I just wanted to... Uh, you might have covered it, but I I noticed that uh, France is actually in um, um, is it Bentonville, Arkansas, for a VTOL conference, which uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, they're like this is a, a major conference on um, yeah on VTOL. So like, hmm, interesting. Uh, Did you see the Morgan Stanley note? No, I didn't yet. So, yeah, Morgan Stanley dropped two notes. One of them was they believe that Tesla is going to get into, um, first he said drones, just by following, you know, Elon talking about the Chinese drones and how important it is for national security that they need to create drones. The second thing is, uh, could they do the EV eVTOL? And, you know, I threw that off as like, yeah, dreaming way in the future. Then you realize, well, hey, if they are already doing something with the, with the Roadster and have that float, but then it's a debate between, you know, you know that Elon's not going to create a flying car. He's already said that that's just not going to happen. It's more likely that they're going to do a SpaceX thing. Uh, so that part is all confusing. But yeah, I did not realize that he was actually at that conference. That is yeah. very interesting information. Yeah. Gary. I talked to Sebastian Thren about this. He started a company to do eTolls. He also was the first uh, the guy who set up uh, the Waymo company. So he's a smart dude. And he was like laid out a scenario. Well, what if you have a job in a city center like San Francisco and you can't afford a house there because the houses there are the two to five million dollars to start a house, right? Uh, well, what if you lived in, uh, you know, uh, Manteca or Sacramento or somewhere like that? Well, you you could take a self-driving car to uh, a, a building that has a, on the top of it a bunch of e-tolls that are taking off every hour or every half an hour. You get out of your uh, autonomous car, you walk up to to the top uh, flight deck in the building or take an elevator, and now you're flying uh, from Manteca to San Francisco, which is it's less than 120 miles, which is the uh, less than the range for these eTolls. Well, now you can get to San Francisco in 20 minutes for a fairly cheap price because there's no human flying the vehicle. It's all autonomous and, and it's electric driven. So it's very cheap to take a, a vehicle a flight like that to downtown San Francisco. You get on top of another building, you could take the elevator down, you get another autonomous car to take you to your work. And in, in an, less than an hour, you're at work for a cheap price and you're living in a place where a house is $500,000 instead of three Three or four million dollars. Yeah, uh, for this interesting, you know, for the 1010 event, I actually think it is more probable that they show the Roadster versus showing the next generation vehicles, unless the next generation vehicles are literally ready for production, maybe later this quarter. That's the only way I would see them showing them uh, because you don't want. You know, Tesla's very sensitive about Osborning their existing sales. So that's interesting. This whole con the roadster coming back. I know it's not a lot in sales, but it is kind of a symbolic thing for the company in terms of making the highest performing, you know, vehicle on the planet. And I'm sure that's why they went back to the drawing board on acceleration and on a bunch of other things in this potential SpaceX package. So 1010, I mean it is 
I mean, Elon did talk about revealing the Roadster by the end of the year. We're, you know, here, call it 10 weeks from the end of the year. So um, maybe, or maybe it's a separate event. Um, but I almost think like the probability of the Roadster kind of being a one more thing kind of thing is greater than them showing the other vehicles. But uh, who knows? The star of the show has to be the Robo Taxi. And, it, and it, to me, the vehicle is my opinion. I think it's going to look extremely cool. I don't think it's going to look like some like goofy thing. It's just like, it, to me, it's going to be synonymous to what Tesla did with EVs and the Model S. When the Model S came out, it was like, okay, wow, this is a really cool looking car. Oh my God, it's an EV. It's amazing uh, looking. It's like, how do we make a, a sporty looking sedan that can seat five people, you know, comfortably it's a kind of a family car but it's ultra performance you know when all the other evs look dorky and plasticky and same thing now with the robo taxis they all kind of look like um you know it kind of they all kind of look like you know when you were a young kid and like maybe you had like a neck injury and that kid coming the you know the you know with the you know with the things around you know the bolts and everything like and, and like it looks like like the road the robo taxis look like just like they look like prototype like they don't look like refined production projects so i think you're going to see what the tesla robo tax did this is going to be something that you're actually going to want to be seen in and i think that's what tesla is going to stress on 1010 and um it'll be interesting i don't know if there's any other theories for for 1010 and we robot and this is why the experience in the vehicles is so important. Having video yeah. games to play while the car drives you to work or being able to do a Zoom call because it's nice and quiet in an electric vehicle, that matters. If you need to sit in a park it, parking lot waiting for a coworker or something, you can sit there for a couple hours on a hot day and work. And, and, and that's the advantage of electric vehicles. But Tesla's going to put that all together. And I, I think that's good. Does that have an effect on cor the fourth quarter? Well, it certainly doesn't hurt, right? Because all of a sudden there's all this new awareness. Oh, shit, Tesla's here with its F full self-driving car. Uh, it's robo-taxis around the corner, right? All that drives car sales because people are not stupid. They know that they have to drive an hour to work every day yeah, you, here's a car that drives itself and lets you have some of that hour back. Even today it does, right? And how good is it going to be in a year? Tesla is still, my car is seven and a half years old and it's still improving every freaking month. It's to crazy. Jeff's, to Jeff's point, you know, the, the Elon has this cool factor that whenever he, you know, he's designing a car with Tesla, it's got to be cool looking and he goes to extreme lengths probably sometimes like beyond extreme lengths in order to make a car that's really cool looking um and sometimes you know it, it costs them um in terms of the cool factor i mean the model x is the most ridiculous cool car but you know is it you know is it the most efficient um with the falcon wing doors eh, but my god they're cool um and and I, but i think that it's one thing that's overlooked. I, I, I know a lot of people are talking about the robo taxi, how it's just going to be a utilitarian vehicle and it does not matter what it looks like. And maybe they're going to show it and people can say, oh, it's a flop. But every car they've come out with is an, a huge hit um, and they sort of get it. And to Jeff's point, if they can, and, and I think they will, this is my only speculation is it's going to be really cool looking. And everybody says, well, people take Ubers today because they have to. But if you can create a car that not only will get you to A to B that it, and, it, and it costs less than an Uber, but it does it safer and it looks really cool and people want to be in it. And they're like, OK, I don't need to own a car, but oh, my God, I want to take that for a drive. I want to show up you know, in, in, at the party in that vehicle. I think that is probably what's what we're going to see, you know, it's and maybe not everybody gets it, but it's going to be a really cool car. And I think I think the other big announcement is going to be and I was just trying to look up some stats on this. I don't know, I'm getting a weird 
response from ChatGPT, but I'm just, I think the other thing is Tesla, we, we don't have to debate it, but I, I, it's just my opinion. We're allowed to have opinions. I think Tesla, the other big announcement is the imminent release, not maybe that day, maybe later that quarter, maybe soon, but the, of the Tesla network. And I think that's the other big announcement for 1010. And that is the precursor from going, you know, supervised, unsupervised. And I was just trying to pull up the total available market for Uber and like how many rides do they get per year? And I got some number of like 7 billion rides in a year. I don't know if that even sounds right or not. That's worldwide. And they're saying like the U.S. is like a third of their business. I don't know if these numbers are right. I'm going to look at another source. But the point is, is there's a, there's a market there to go after. And Tesla has a different business model uh, with their vehicles and their vehicles are everywhere. So if you can kind of see the, the pieces coming together, Tesla gets full self-driving and they get it really good in, in its home, like continent in North America. And then they get it over to Asia and they get it over to Europe and then they get it stable and they get it working really well there and they get a relationship with the regulators. And then the path to approval um, is, you know, going from supervised then to unsupervised and you're already approved then for supervised in all these different regions and you have the Tesla network running. To me, it's kind of a logical thing. And it's almost like if analysts could walk out of 1010 with, oh my God, the robo taxi is the car you want to be seeing. And the robo taxis are cool now. They actually, like, they look really good. And then Tesla's na- announcing this Uber like competitor that's, that's going to be coming before the robo taxi. Um, I think if, like, if those are the two takeaways from the event, I think it'd be a, a, like a, a raving success. I think your numbers are accurate, Jeff, or chat yeah. GTP4. It's about, it's, it works out to 5 million rides per day, which I think is pretty accurate. Yeah, that's a huge market, and it's a different model, uh, and it and it looks like it could be better for the driver, and it could be you know, better for the network operator, Tesla, in this in this situation. So, and it, it, I don't know, to me, like something has to be going on. Like, why is Uber racing to partner with everybody? Like, like as a lead up into this event, like, why is that happening? Was that going to happen anyway? Um, maybe, but like, anyway, I don't, again, I said I wasn't going to debate it and I started even debating myself, but I think if, if you were to ask me like what would what would be amazing on ten ten, I think it would be you come out of that event with my God, the robo taxi looks like this is the thing I want to be. I want to be given I want to show up into an event in this thing and have it open up and there's no driver inside and this thing looks freaking cool. And then you know, by the way, Tesla has this massive network running ahead of that. Uber has a couple things that we want. One, if you go to Prague Airport, you arrive at the airport, the only taxi, the only taxi available is Uber. It's the, it has a monopoly there at that airport. And that's true of many places in the world that Uber is the default choice. It's the, it's the brand, it's trusted. We know what it is, et cetera, et cetera. It also has an air traffic control system, which has been worked on for since the beginning. They know how to move a car to a customer uh, quickly, often in less than a minute. If you're in downtown San Francisco, for instance, I got a uh, Uber ride the other day in less than a minute. Um, that is a huge advantage to Uber, and so Uber is going to want to license that or partner with their companies because they do have a problem. They don't have autonomy. They don't have their own car network. Um, the drivers that are part of Uber bring their own car, and that adds an inconsistency to the brand. Sometimes it's a, a nice Mercedes that picks you up or a nice new Tesla, but sometimes it's a shitty old Toyota. And the human that arrives is also an inconsistency. Sometimes they're really great. Most of the time they are. But sometimes they talk too much. Sometimes they smell. Sometimes they're stoned, right? Sometimes they even uh, harass you or uh, or cause uh, women problems, for instance. Um, and that's happened in the, in the past with Uber, and it keeps their brand uh, quality down. 
Tesla doesn't have those problems, but they do need uh, the distribution and the the uh, air traffic control system, which we haven't seen. That's another thing I think I'll pay attention to a lot at 1010, is what is the air traffic control system that they're building? How are they going to get these vehicles to pick people up at airports or sporting events or hotels or, or our homes, right? That's going to be real important. And maybe they do partner. There's a lot that can happen in just a few days. You know, if Elon gets, sits down with the right person and does a deal. Right. If I may, just to, just to push back on that, Robert, I don't think that's an issue. Maybe somebody can chime in. I mean, it's kind of like when I call my car uh, and I'm in a parking lot and or sorry, I'm coming out of the grocery store and it comes and picks me up. It just sees where I am. It's actually going to be easier than calling an Uber. You just open your app it sees on GPS where you are and it just comes and picks you up and it's, and it's, and it's done. So like that, the that's true aspect. most of the time, most rides, but there are some rides and you need to get it. Like, like I was at a music. Oh, you're festival. talking about the airport with air traffic control. No, no, air tra when I say air traffic control, Uber has built a system so that they know where all the cars are and they know where the potential riders are and they move cars to the potential rider um, areas so, so that they have a more efficient business, right? Uh, Travis, who started Uber, told me, uh, I, I interviewed him in front of Stanford Business School because Uber was embedded right in front of me. And he said, my goal is to have a one car next to you when you call an uber that way i can get that car to you in less than a minute that's a home run in this book if there's more than one car sitting around well that's inefficient for the drivers they're not making money because they're sitting somewhere waiting for a, a, a ride to pick up right yeah I just, I just don't i don't think that's an issue with tesla they're solving full self-driving this is like a, uh, a small compute well, it's you know, a different issue. system than, than FSD. We have to see it and how it works and how good is it. Then there's the, the problem of picking people up at like a music festival or an airport. You have to get your car through the regulation system. Well, Uber hasn't done a whole lot of work there yet, right, that we know of. And are they going to go worldwide? Are they going to send employees worldwide to make a deal with Prague Airport so that they can have a Tesla pickup line, right, where Teslas come into the airport and pick everybody up, that that hasn't been built yet. So does Tesla say, oh, you know what, we do, we do need that. Maybe we do a licensing deal with Uber to get uh, Tesla uh, robo-taxis into every airport and every music festival and every sporting event. Not a chance. Right? I, I'll, I'll bet you $10. Okay. <laughs> so bucks. you're you're in the they're gonna build it all themselves and they're gonna figure they it out and to. they're gonna they well you do you do need to have a ability to for a humanless car to come into an airport that means you had to do a deal with an airport because they can keep your car from coming into the airport uh, absolutely but you see right. everywhere else and you just have a huge network Sorry. Uh, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting debate I think it's one of these things where if Tesla launches the Tesla network what's the biggest thing that gives you leverage is going to be subscribers and, 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 and growing that sub count. And I think it's going to be one of those things where maybe they, they don't do a deal from day one. They don't need to do potentially a deal, but it'd be one of those things where you come back and say, all right, you've got a big ride sharing business, Uber. We have a big ride sharing business, Tesla. We're probably going to get to this kind of ubiquitous autonomy before you and kind of the job shop you have of like, 12 different partners doing it. So there's probably a deal to be made when Tesla has even greater leverage. I mean, it's not to say that they don't have a lot of leverage today, but my God, if they have a, a, a ride sharing uh, network with millions of, of subs, then it's a, it's a different conversation. And then like, why would those two work together? Well, it's, it's for some of the reasons that Robert mentioned, but it could also just be, you know, it goes back to the fundamental laws of supply and demand and around utilization. And the way to improve your cost structure is to be able to load share uh, between the two and to be able, and, that, and that's that's going to be one of the biggest cost drivers in the whole, in, in a ride sharing network is just your ability to drive utilization. So 
we could talk forever on some of these, you know, wonky topics. I think we are getting, you know, closer it's to It's important, the though. I mean, I, at Coachella, Uber has a huge parking lot. It can hold hundreds of cars, right? And yeah. they had a whole structure for their customers to stand outside, you know, underneath so they're not in the bright sunlight waiting for an Uber drive. They spent a lot of money and a lot of effort putting just that into Coachella, big music festival down in Palm Springs, right? Well, Tesla doesn't have enough parking lot yet, so they have to make deals with all these music festivals, all these sporting arenas. It, you know, you do have to figure out how to get people into a sporting arena, drop them off, and then after the game, come and pick them up. How are you going to do that? Particularly in a chaotic place where streets are closed and people are crossing the street. I mean, I, I, I just was at a music festival this last weekend. It's very hard driving through through some of those places because they've closed streets and, and the map is taking you the wrong place and stuff like that. There is a need for Tesla to innovate greatly on that. Uh, I'm going to be looking closely and talking to employees about this at, at 1010. You know, Great. How do they yeah, really make this a world brand where people, you know, know that there's going to be a Tesla there to pick them up after a, a sporting event, a music festival, getting out of a hotel, getting out of an airplane airport, right? Because that's where we're going to use a lot of uh, cyber cabs, robo taxi kind of uh, be behaviors. That's 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 the first order of business. You get that all figured out, then all the other network advantages advantages of tesla have come to pair absolutely and, and it'll be interesting to find out too like who at tesla is head of product for the robo taxi business like who is thinking of all this and who's pulling it all together everybody wants to come back with the easy answer well it's elon well no he's not you know maybe right in the beginning or at some point and he certainly the, can't do all that you can't yeah, go around can't. to coachella and make exactly. relationships and get a exactly. parking lot and get exactly. a structure built but, yeah. and, but but jeff, right? yeah. and, but jeff and get Robert, signs put yeah. up jeff you i i really like the fact that you're sort of presenting all of these it, you're making my mind sort of work and think about the these aspects but think about it for a second so um first of all uh number one What's their objective? Accelerate the, the world's transition to renewable transportation and energy. So does it does that achieve their mission in terms of partnering with Uber? Well, if they did, the only cars that they could partner with Uber would be Tesla's, period, yes. because they're the only ones that have the, the, the hardware. And it's going to take years for other cars to have that. So then if you're an Uber driver, and you have the ability to put an app on your phone or you have the ability to use your existing Uber, the app on your phone will just drive itself. You don't have to get there. Yeah. So I don't know if that will actually, it, it's not part of their, their mission. It's, it, it doesn't align with that. They don't need to partner with them, their mission. And so where do they focus? They say, look, if you have an Uber, if you have a Tesla, here's the app, take it, drive it. You don't have to drive it actually. It's going to drive itself, and you just have to clean it and charge it. And Tesla's in, in back back there making robo taxis. They're not focused on this anymore. They're going to make a robo taxi for whatever the cost twenty thousand dollars, and sell as and, and and put as many of these on the road. So I just yeah, I'm pushing back a bit, but I appreciate you 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 know the thought process because you made me think about this. And to me, it's as, as clear as day that no, there's absolutely no reason for them to do that. Well, it's not. It's, it, what I said is it may not need to be a day one thing, but it may need to be something where, if they approach significant, when they approach significant scale, you come back to it and say, "All right, who are the biggest players here?" And then, is there a way for us? Do we do we ever work together? Um, yes or no? It's 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 a debatable topic. Uh, again, driving utilization is the the biggest thing that drives all this surge pricing and. And, you know, and, and drives the whole model in this business is supply and demand. So um, what what better way to deal with it, you know, than a, a, some sort of eventual partnership? But it doesn't have to happen. And I'm not saying it's a day one thing. It's more one of those things you come back and you always revisit um, if it helps your business model. Um, so anyway, you know, it's, I thought this was a great discussion. I think we're approaching the top of the hour, two hours in. We don't normally let these things go much beyond that. Um, we've got uh, deliveries coming up tomorrow, 
And then I think I did some quick math in my head. We're about just over 200 hours away from the 1010 event. And that's a big deal in Tesla's history. I think Elon has said this is one for the record books or for the history books. And, and then we've got obviously earnings after that, but 1010 is the big thing for uh, October. And then of course the advancements in autonomy and what they're releasing out to all the, <clears throat> all the consumers. The uh, final thing I'll just say is for me, my experience from a year ago, I always like looking like, what, where were we at a year ago? Like, you know, September 30th or October 1st of 2023. And I was probably using FSD 30% of the time when I get in the vehicle. Now it's about 90% of the time. It's just that much better. And I wonder how that translates uh, for, you know, for uptake. But yeah, um, big events coming up starting tomorrow morning. And then with the 1010 events, I appreciate everyone uh, tuning in, all the speakers on the panel, um, you know, Omar, Robert, tremendous contributions today, Gary, Simon, and of course, our co-hosts, uh, Herbert and Xander, please follow, uh, like, subscribe to all the speakers. They spend time sharing information. And uh, we do this every Tuesday at 5 Central. Uh, please come back again. Have a great rest of your day and evening. Thank you. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.